Just going to set that there. <laughs> I will never forget the first time I saw the Grand Canyon. I was about six or seven years old at the time. I can't remember exactly. And I can't say that I remember anything else about, well, really anything about that time in my life. <laughs> But I distinctly remember the feeling that I had standing on the south rim of the Grand Canyon and looking out at the beauty of God's creation, the majesty of that place. I don't remember what I thought at that young age, but I do remember the impact it had on me. I remember how I felt standing there. I felt awe. I felt wonder. I felt humility. And I felt amazed. It left such an indelible impression on me that I think as my memories start to fade, that's one of those that'll stick with me. I'll forget my own name, but I'll remember that trip to the Grand Canyon when I was six or seven years old. There are some things, some events in our lives that leave just such impressions on us, on our memory. How many of you remember exactly where you were when you heard that Pre President Kennedy was assassinated? Quite a few. Uh, or when the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded. Or when the attacks in 9-11 happened. It's a real thing. These emotional events have a real impact on our memory. They're etched in. In psychology, these ultra-strong memories are called flashbulb memories. It's a real phenomenon. When there are such strong emotions tied to an event, the amygdala in the brain triggers the hippocampus, which causes the memory to be, uh, it causes the brain to process more efficiently, therefore the memory is etched in. Uh, a little too much science there, a little too nerdy for you. <laughs> you know me. And what on earth, Pastor Greg, is the point, for crying out loud? Well, I'm thinking about the emotional impact that the gospel can have on a child. As we prepare for Vacation Bible School this week, uh, we are contemplating sharing the saving grace of Jesus Christ with the children of our community. And if we do our jobs right, and we open up even one of those children's hearts to the knowledge that Jesus Christ loves them personally, then we could create a flashbulb memory for that child that will last them the rest of their life. So why is sharing the gospel with children so important? Is sharing the gospel with children important? <laughs> I'm pretty sure our reading today will leave no doubt in your minds as to the answer to those questions. So turn with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 18, verses 15 through 17. Short reading this week. There's a crowd gathered around Jesus as he's teaching and answering some questions of the Pharisees, starting in verse 15. Then they, the crowd, also brought infants to him that he might touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him and said, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. So let me set the stage a little bit here for you. In Luke's telling of Jesus' ministry, Jesus had just left Capernaum. It's a small fishing village on the Sea of Galilee. And he was w working his way to Jerusalem, but he was doing it by kind of a circuitous route, taking a winding path to Jerusalem. He and his disciples had just entered into Judea, which is on the other side of the Jordan River. There he was confronted by a group of Pharisees who were kind of grilling him about the kingdom of God because his teachings had been about the kingdom and they wanted to know if what he was teaching matched up with what they knew. Jesus gave a series of parables at this time in his teaching that explained the kingdom and in the meantime was gathering quite the impressive crowd of listeners, of students, of people eager to hear his teachings. So these would have been Judeans and Samaritans who had heard stories of this miraculous uh, healer and teacher. Uh, Matthew 8, for example, tells us of one such example that uh, was a reputation maker. Matthew 8, verses 2 and 3, And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. 
Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing. Be cleansed. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Now, ironically, Jesus told the leper not to tell anyone what had happened. He said, go to your priest, do the required offering, give credit where credit's due to God. He also performed many other healings in this same chapter in Matthew. Of course, Jesus knew this man would go out and tell everybody what had happened because Jesus is God. Of course, he knew what was going to happen. And if you think about it, the man going and telling everyone who had healed him, that's still giving credit to God. And by the time Jesus had reached Judea at this time in our reading, his reputation kind of preceded him. People had heard about the things that he was doing and the things that he was teaching. Now, Matthew 19 and Mark 10, the other synoptic gospels, also record the incident that we read in our main reading today. How when they heard about the miracle worker from Nazareth, people brought their little children and they brought them forward to give to him so that he could bless them. And that's where the Grand Canyon and the flashbulb memory thing comes in. Can you imagine the emotional response that the spirits of these little children would have having Jesus himself lay his hands upon them? Can you imagine how our spirit would respond to Jesus' touch? I hope that you can. I hope that you have felt it. Maybe when you asked him into your heart for the very first time. Even the infants must have sensed in their spirits that there was a significant event happening in their lives. They're having God himself in the flesh lay his hands upon them to give them a special blessing. I think maybe the infants might even recognize that more than us grown-ups. Mm -hmm. You see, the word children in Luke, uh, the Greek is brephos, which means child in arms or child that can't walk yet, so very young children is how Luke's describing this. Interestingly, the other synoptic gospels use the Greek word uh, pahedion, which means children of a learning age, basically, or children being taught. Uh, so that implies older children. My, my interpretation of that uh, discrepancy is that there were kids of all ages, and these are families, whole families coming out of their houses to hear Jesus teach. No matter what their age, though, no matter how old anyone was in the presence of Jesus Christ, the love, the joy, the power that flowed from the Savior would have touched their spirit in such a way that I believe would have been even more memorable for them than the Grand Canyon was to me at six or seven years old. I mean, that's a flashbulb memory coming into the presence of the Messiah. So why then were the disciples so anxiously engaged in stopping these parents from bringing their kids to, uh, to Jesus? As we read in verse 15, see, in those days, children were not very highly regarded. They were seen as kind of a nuisance. They were foolish. They were dirty. They were annoying. Some people today probably share some of those <laughs> ancient sentiments. <laughs> but culturally, children were just not very important in those days. We know that from history. We know that from the very Bible. In fact, Proverbs, Proverbs 22, 15, the first part, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. And you go another couple of verses, uh, 29, 15, the second half, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Kids were just seen as foolish and embarrassing and dirty and annoying. Something you had to put up with until they got old enough to start working and start contributing and become the men and women that they would become. Both those verses that I shared from Proverbs are about rebuking and correcting children, by the way. These immature, foolish creatures called kids. And even in the New Testament times, the analogy of new believers being like babes is a little bit derogatory. Hebrews 5.13 for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. It's a little bit of a scolding, a little bit of a derogatory. My kids complain they get a bad rap, <laughs> they, that they have it tough. Kids back then, I tell you what. <laughs> but you know, Peter used the same analogy of a new believer being a babe. But he used it the same way that Jesus, I believe, is using it in this teaching in our main reading today. 1 Peter 2.2, 2, good reminder, as newborn babes, 
desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So I kind of like Peter's spin on that way children are seen. Yeah, we all have something we got to learn. And we all know where we need to go to learn it. We need to desire that learning, desire to grow up in our maturity in the word. Just as Jesus said, we ourselves must become as children in order to come into a knowledge of his kingdom and his fullness. More on that in just a moment. You see, there are two main theological points in our very brief reading today. Love it. The Bible can pack a punch in just a couple of words. Two main theological points. The first one is that no one, not even children, not even children how they were seen back then, should ever be refused access to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All should be given the opportunity. None should be uh, kept from the foot of Jesus Christ. Yet here we have the disciples fiercely protective of their rabbi, their beloved rabbi, trying to keep his time from being wasted on these annoying, dirty, foolish kids <laughs> who wouldn't understand his teachings anyway. Isn't the point that everybody can come and learn? These kids can't learn. Get them out of here. All of this background that I've been giving you on how kids were seen in those days is kind of a roundabout way of showing you that b biblically the disciples really weren't jerks. <laughs> they weren't just being mean. I'm actually fairly certain they would have been caught off guard by Jesus' rebuke. when he said, no, let the kids come to me. I think they might have been a little shocked, a little surprised. Oh, wow. I believe they thought they were doing what the Savior would have them do. That they believed they were protecting him and doing the right thing. But not so, says Jesus. In verse 16, he rebukes them, let the little children come. He says, because of such, in other words, of those who have become like children, that is the kingdom. That's what I've been preaching to you about. That's what I've been teaching you about my kingdom. They thought they were doing what the Messiah would have wanted them to do. Now, these children weren't necessarily old enough or mature enough to be really accountable for any sins, for their sins, but they were born into sinful fallen bodies, into a sinful fallen world. And when they did reach an age where they could be accountable, where they understood right from wrong, Jesus knew that without the message he brought, without the grace he offers us, those children would choose sin, would fall into the fallen nature of this world, would be lost. Let the little children come, he said. What better time, Jesus is saying, he's implying, what better time to make a flashbulb memory, a flashbulb impression on their lives than right now as infants, as toddlers, as school children? What better time to make that impact on their hearts so that when they do face the darkness that's in this world, they'll have that memory, that taste that something deep within them, that impression that there is somewhere to turn, that there is hope. As children, their habits are just beginning to form. As children, they're just starting to learn the ways of the world and how to behave. And if they have good parents, maybe they're learning some good habits. But I guarantee you, they're learning some bad ones too. We got to give them that dose of God's truth, of God's word, of that feeling. Remember I talked about at the beginning at the Grand Canyon's Edge, I don't remember what I was thinking about. I just remember the impact. We need to give kids that feeling. You are loved. You are loved by the God who made you, who made the world and everything in it. You are personally known and loved, and he is there to forgive you, to save you, from the darkness, from the sin in this world. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it, Proverbs 22, 6. That's why the work we do this coming week at VBS is so important. Same reason that Jesus said, let the little children come. I say it too, let the little children come to Bandon First Baptist Church. Because we're following Jesus' example and sharing with impressionable young people the most important message they will ever hear for their entire lives. The message of Jesus Christ. 
So message one, let the little children come. That's the theological lesson, the first theological lesson in today's reading. Let the little children come. The younger we can plant those seeds of faith in the next generation, the more likely it is that those seeds will take root in their lives and guide the direction of their lives. But I did tell you there were two messages in this week's reading. Message number two, verse 17 in our reading tells us, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, and it doesn't mean when you're a little child, it means like a little child. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will by no means enter it. He taught the same truth in Capernaum, too, when his disciples were, at, were asking him, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? Which cracks me up. They're arguing over who's going to be higher ranked in, uh, in heaven. And Jesus answers them. He calls a little child to him. And in Matthew 18, 2 and 3, then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. He's saying, don't worry about who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You need to be like this child or you're not even going to be there. We have to be like little children in the way that we come to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Which makes the example of Jesus commanding his disciples to let the little children come even more relevant to us. How, you might ask, can we become more like those little children? How do we do that? In our approach to Christ, in our approach to the gospel, how do we become like little children? What does that mean? Well, let's look at some of the characteristics that children possess. They're joyful when they decide to be joyful. <laughs> Watch a little baby playing with soap bubbles, for example. That's the first impression that popped into my head when I was writing this sermon. Watch a baby playing with soap bubbles or a little toddler at the zoo watching the monkeys play. <laughs> That's the best. The looks on their faces, the rapt joy that they have. There's a giggly sort of joy in kids, in their little hearts. Those giggles of delight come from a complete lack of jadedness because jadedness takes a while. It takes experiences. There's a sweet sort of innocence to children unless you've spent time with a three-year-old. Whoever named it the Terrible Twos, by the way, <laughs> was out of their mind. <laughs> All of my kids, it was the threes. The twos were beautiful. It was the threes. <laughs> All my kids became Tasmanian devils <laughs> at the age of three. All of them. <laughs> Still, until children are emotionally uh, and intellectually mature enough, uh, even in their impish troublemaking, there's still this sweet little innocence. They're not trying to hurt anybody. They're not trying to be evil. They're just little imps. <laughs> and they're very sweet, even when they're in trouble. <laughs> Kids are trusting, too. Kids are trusting because they haven't yet learned how people let you down. They haven't yet learned how people can fail you and hurt you. They have an innate sense of faith that whatever they need will just come to them. I'm hungry. Oh, look, food. It's as though they kind of expect good things to happen. Sadly, yes, just like us grown-ups, if we're honest with ourselves, they will throw a tantrum when what they expect doesn't happen. We do the same thing. Don't think that's unique to kids. But they trust. They trust innately up to a certain point, a certain age. And believe it or not, kids are humble in their own way. Yes, they are self-centered. Everything is kind of about them and their needs. Uh, but that's just an emotional stage of childhood. But they're also completely dependent. And for a time, they're good with that. They're okay with being completely dependent on someone. They're okay with saying, I don't know how, or show me. When does that go out of us? That, that humility, that willingness to say, oh, I don't know. They're not afraid to be completely dependent on their parents for everything that they need. They have no shame of it. And they're always caught by surprise when something delightful happens to them. Have you noticed that? An unexpected gift, an unexpected treat after dinner, 
and they just light up like Christmas trees. It's just a beautiful thing. What a wonderful gift. They know they don't deserve it. It just came to them. What a wonderful thing. Now, of course, kids are not perfect. <laughs> They're fallen just like we are. And they can be mean. They can be frustrating. They can be troublemakers with a rotten streak. And yes, all of my kids have been through at least some of those phases. <laughs> And like people in the disciples' days observed, they can be foolish and they can be irritating. But from the entirety of Jesus' and his disciples' teachings, we can pretty easily ascertain those characteristics of childhood, of those childlike things that Jesus says we need in order to understand and approach his kingdom. When we're approaching his kingdom, in other words, which is to say our life as Christians, as the kingdom of God, we need to approach it as the kingdom that is within us, Luke 17, 21. We can kind of check ourselves by the criteria of those characteristics taught in Scripture that are as little children. So some questions we can ask ourselves, kind of a mental checklist we can go through. Are we, one, joyful? Do we have a deep and profound joy over the beautiful gift of God's love and salvation that we have been freely given. Matthew 13, 44. Love this one. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, went, or he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Do we have that kind of joy over the blessings God has given us? That we would gladly give up everything else because look what we have hidden in this field, hidden in our hearts. Are we awestruck with wonder like a little child, like young me at the edge of the Grand Canyon? Are we just struck by the awe and the majesty of God's saving grace? Do we rejoice from our head down to our socks when we think about what Jesus Christ has done for us personally, does everything that we have pale in comparison to that joy, to that treasure hidden in the field? Are we, number two, expectant in our faith like little children? Do we absolutely trust that God is in control? It's easy to do when things are going well. But do we truly trust that even when things aren't going well, God's got it under control? That God is the one who provides all of our needs according to His glorious riches in Christ Jesus, Philippians 4.19. Let's read Luke 11.13 also because this is an important reminder. Luke 11.13, If you then, being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? If we who are fallen sinners know how to do good things for our children, of course, God, our heavenly Father, is doing nothing but good things for us, blessing us in ways we can't even see, we, we, we can't even imagine He's always there. He is always blessing us. And he uses even our trials for our own good to those who love him. Are we, number three, trusting? Does our faith make us bold to do the things we know we should be doing for him? Trusting that he will provide whatever we need in order to get it done. Do we really trust him? Are we bold in our trust like the blind man who in the same chapter as our reading today cried out to the Lord despite the fact that his buddies were telling him to shush? Luke 18, 38. Then those who went before warned him that he should be quiet, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. That's trust. That's in being emboldened by trust. 
Are we, number four, innocent? Remember that childlike innocence I talked about? Not perfect, mind you, because none of us are. But innocent in our intentions and as best we can in our actions day by day, are we trying to live according to the complete innocence that is given to us by Jesus Christ? And finally, are we, number five, are we humble? Do we truly know deep down inside that we don't deserve salvation? That we have it because of God's love, not because of our own merits? That we have salvation because of Christ's grace through no effort of our own? Those are the attributes that Scripture tells us time and time again are desirable in children. Those five things. Paul adds a caveat in his letter to Corinth that in some ways we do need to be mature. In some ways we need to not be like little children. Let's read it. 1 Corinthians 14.20 Brethren, do not be children in understanding. However, in malice, be babes. But in understanding, be mature. That speaks to the innocence of childhood. Children don't know everything yet. They're little sponges. They learn way faster than we do, that's for sure. But they don't know it yet. We are to know it. We have a responsibility to grow in our maturity in the Word. But in our intentions, in our spirit, we need to have those characteristics of childhood that present us absolutely dependent on our Heavenly Father for all of our blessings, for all of everything, for our salvation. There needs to be a sweet innocence of intention in our walk, but a growing maturity in our understanding of the Word. That's why we come to church. That's why we do Bible studies. I'd like to finish today with a reading of the middle section of Jesus' Sermon on the Beatitudes. And I ask you all, as we finish up today, to prayerfully consider how today's message applies to you personally. Matthew 5, we'll read verses 5 through 8, right in the middle of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's the kingdom that Jesus is preaching, brothers and sisters. That's the kingdom that Jesus is preparing for us and in us. That's the kingdom that I look forward to. That's the kingdom we preach to these children this coming week. That's the kingdom that I desire for each and every one of you. And that is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's get the worship team back up here and let's